I'm a practitioner more than a theorist, a theorist I think, and um, I've got one foot in a very long tradition of earthwork survey, and I've got another foot increasingly in the, the what's become the new tradition of digital modeling. So I haven't decided whether uh, I'm part of the revolution, and counter-revolution, whether I'm a reactionary, and this is all work in progress as we think it through as a national body trying to deal with this sort of stuff. So we have a tradition of earthwork survey, which I think is still relevant alongside LIDAR and phot photogrammetry. But can it withstand critical perspectives that are coming in now, which characterize it as inherently subjective, the view of one or two people, elitist, the view of one or two people, when it's compared to the essentially objective products of digital scanning? So this paper doesn't answer that, it just asks questions, which is always the best place to start. So I don't know if I need to tell you much about the, uh, the long tradition of British Field Survey. It's, uh, it's long. You can take it back to John Aubrey if you want to, in the 17th century, where he starts to observe, map what he observes, and use his images to carry that interpretation. Then go through a succession of uh, classically interested British map makers for the Ordnance Survey and otherwise, and they map the far end of that with the Royal Commissions in Scotland, in England, in Wales, who produce the sort of high-density Hasher diagrams that you're probably fairly familiar with as the sort of thing you look alongside of a, a hill forts or something like that. Arguably, depends who you talk to, of course, and how old they are, um, this reached a peak of per perfection in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, 2020, whatever you like. But it's, it's, it's fairly unique to Britain. There was a strong paper about this written by Mark Bowden and Dave McComish about uh, 10 years ago, which firmly planted this as a British tradition. It's also a dying British tradition, I would argue, because these commissions that I mentioned and fellow travellers in archaeology are underfunded and dying out. So that leaves space for digital modelling, of course. I could say, I mean, this is Mark Bowden's words, the British tradition comprises close observation, interpretation of ground surfaces, direct measurement of all significant features, detailed analysis, the relationships and a plan that illustrates the interpretation you arrive at. Uh, Fradley, who was at TAG four or five years ago, uh, mentioned this as a two-dimensional map of earthworks created by visually breaking down their form into composite separate slopes, typically depicted by Hasher symbolism. Hasher, friends of the Hasher, we're a dying breed. I actually run something called Hasher Hour for, for colleagues in English Heritage Historic England just to remind people how we used to do this sort of thing. So there's a fine example. That would have been by my co-presenter, Olaf, who hasn't been able to make it today because of transport problems. That's uh, a little bit of Lampier Cops, the Silchester Environments Project. So you've got a hill fort hiding in the centre there, some earthworks coming away from it, which radiated from it, and then the great big curve thing going round as part of the Oppidan boundary that hoovered up the, uh, the hill fort in the process. So how do you do this? You go out into the field, um, you normally spend a day or two or three or four or two weeks or however long it takes with a colleague going around taking the tops and bottoms of slopes, either graphically using tapes and you know, pencils and that sort of thing, or using digital recording technologies, GPS, GNSS, that sort of thing, creating a sort of wireframe, I suppose you'd call it in modern parlance. You then take that back out into the field after you've processed it, or you carry on working if you start it graphically, and you start to sketch in the, the weights of slope. Weight of ink is weight of slope, in a sense. So it's a very intuitive way of doing it, or at least I think so, but I'm beginning to wonder whether this is a language that not everybody speaks anymore. And then eventually you take that rough field drawing into the uh, process, whether through CAD or Illustrator or whatever, and you create something with a production model of it. The point is, though, it's not just a process, it's a dialogue throughout. You've got a couple of people talking about this all the time. If you can't convince the person standing next to you that that thing is there, and it probably isn't there. And that's where it's, I think creeping objectivity starts to come in alongside the subjectivity. So, uh, just flicking into my notes for a second, excuse me. So it doesn't stand apart from other sorts of survey. It's a complementary Thing alongside aerial survey, geophysics, ultimately leading to excavation. In many cases, it sort of sets the framework into which you then do the thing you want to do. Practitioners argue that the approach is about capturing an interpretation rather than a truly metric thing. It's about what you see and how you, uh, how you uh, interpret it. And it is, in a sense, a visualization of an interpretation. Somebody's made a choice what to show, what not to show. And that, of course, is also makes it open to criticism because it's not fully objective. 
So as the, uh, the world's moving on, we've tried to move on with it. This is going back about a decade, so we're moving fairly slowly at times. This is somewhere in the North Pennines around Alston, 2000 and, um, 2010, I think we're out doing this sort of thing. The spoke LIDAR, I think it was 50 centimetres, which 10 years ago was, wow, 50 centimetres. And we basically went out and this composition of tech and tradition, we <laughs> had pencils to draw on top of the LIDAR in the field to show things of archaeological interest and to write notes alongside of them. So that's fine in terms of big blobs and roughly what is it. But then when we had something detailed to do, which is like Whitley Castle there, one of the, the weirdest trying, uh, trapezoidal courts in, in, in Northern Europe, Roman fort south of the wall, it made more sense to go back to old principles and do it as a measured survey. Two people, three weeks, dead of winter, bloody awful, fantastic result, I think. I was one of the two people who did it. Then we started thinking about how do you balance these two things. This is uh, Thornton Abbey, Thornton Abbey Gatehouse, famous big gatehouse out in Lincolnshire. We have um, a hill shaded model, which I think is it's, it's LIDAR, uh, probably half meter at the time, set against a slightly earlier, but exactly the same area, earthwork survey done by um, Al Oswald, I think, in this particular case. The LIDAR shows you how incredibly complicated the archaeology is. What the Hasher diagram shows you is how interpreted it can be by spending a lot of time on the site making decisions. Every single thing that is depicted is described. That's the thing. It's not just another version of reality. It's an interpretation of that reality. It may be described and say, we know exactly what this is, the blob up top corner, which is Skinner's terrible post-dissolution house, which was built at great expense and then it fell down. It's great, we've got documents, we know exactly what that is. Other things in the precinct we are less certain of, and we make that entirely clear in the schematic diagrams that went alongside of this. Another attempt to do this, this is you know, as I started to think about uh, using this as a primary survey tool. Uh, this is a um, little bit of moonscape, is ash not lead mine, up near Clitheroe, Lancashire. There's about 400 years worth of lead mining going on in there, which gives you this Swiss cheese thing going into the landscape. For scale, that barn is about 30 to 35 metres long. This is just the top of the knoll, completely undermined by lead mines. 300 aerial photographs taken from a cheap drone. Structural motion, you're probably all fairly familiar with it, creates this pixel, uh, this um, photogrammetric three-dimensional image. And then I drew the hashes on top of it, largely, uh, rather than go out into the field. I drew most of them using, putting it into GIS and drew the hashes on, then went outside, checked my interpretations with a friend, two days in the field as opposed to a week. Is it better? It's a, it's a step along the way towards a hybrid. I don't know if it's better. Thing is, you can do all sorts of things with this stuff. We've now moved into LIDAR hanging off drones, which is great. You can do topical surveys. This is uh, Hunsley, uh, about six months ago in uh, East Yorkshire, a deserted medieval village. Great, you can see the, the village line, you can see the toffs and troughs coming off it, you can do various things, obviously, with slope intensity and with uh, different visualizations based on the angle of where the sun doesn't normally shine, all that sort of thing. Great. Do you understand it? Probably. <laughs> I'm saying no. <laughs> For archaeologists, of course you understand it. Uh, but essentially, it's uninterpreted. It's just a version of reality. So where do we go from here? another version of the same reality. Very helpful. If I can take it out of the field and do more with it on handheld devices, potentially extremely helpful. So that's where we may be going. This is the great advantage. Huge areas quite quickly done in great detail. This is 700 meters or so worth of Solway um, coast, upper tree, just south of, sort of the Solway. Three enclosures, guess which one is prehistoric. I'll leave you to ponder that one. But of course, this was flown in 10 or 15 minutes, processed within a couple of hours. It would have taken me and a traditional survey team possibly days, possibly weeks to have done it as a pair. We still may do that as an experiment to see what we get by visualizing it on the ground, because that's the big difference with this sort of thing. Being there in the landscape, I'm not going to go into phenomenology. I know that's a, that's a bear pit waiting for me to fall into it. I'm not going to see some people. But, you know, there is that possible ingold thing about archaeology as a process of dwelling. You're in the same landscape for a period of time. Um, Dave Field, who was referenced earlier in Judith's talk, very, very experienced field archaeologist, 
he thinks are the closest you can get to understanding Bruegel's, and he, this is published, it's not me making it up, Bruegel's uh, The Reapers, 1610 or whatever, is to spend the same amount of time doing a similar activity in the same place. You'll never get so close to those people unless you're wandering around with a pole, with slow activity, appreciating that landscape from within. So there may be something in that as well. So we're, we're, we're on the cusp, we're moving forward. Perhaps this is a revolution, perhaps I'm late to the revolution, but who knows? Obviously all these tools exist. This is uh, Castilli Henge again in Cornwall. You've got all these wonderful ways of projecting images taken from drones. In the end, the bit that I like the most is when you get to this, and then you can start to put numbers on it, you can start to talk about it, you can start to really understand it in what is probably now an old language an old archaeological language, possibly an archaeological language which is starting to move out of Greece. don't know. Again, you know, what is it? It's a strange looking site, it's up near Berwick, it's not that far south of here really, it's on the Tweed. Is there a, a, a promontory fort lurking in there? I was working with some volunteers last winter to look at that. Yes, there is, it's been ploughed over in the medieval period. We used a combination of things there, we used um, some of this extremely old fashioned drawing from life with a pencil and a, and, a, and, a, and a tape measure approach, which is still the best way to get people to actually understand it in a teaching environment. If you can see, if you can see it, you can draw it. In order to see it, you've got to understand it and so on and so on. And it's an iterative process involving two or more people in what is quite often a protracted argument, really. So I think that's where I was going to leave this, if it's about the right time. It's, it's not the end of the story. I'm hoping to run a session at the um, CIFA conference in April, specifically on this question of practitioners who are using um, air, airborne sensing devices and possibly terrestrial sensing devices to capture earthworks in meaningful ways where you're capturing the interpretation as much as you are capturing the uh, physicality of the thing. And so if there's anyone in the room who feels like coming to that session and talking nuts and bolts of uh, field archaeology with a bunch of uh, practitioners, very welcome indeed. Thank you very much. Mr. Reed.